Hi there, this is Jay Jacobs, and welcome to another episode of Going Beyond the Scale. If you've been watching any of our podcasts or us on YouTube, you know that sometimes I will do a whole long intro about somebody that's our guest. Today, I decided not to because I think it's going to be more interesting for you to hear her personal journey, uh, what I'm kind of calling today an amazing tale of her scale. And I will tell you that there's a lot of people that know, even though she said they don't, I know there's a lot of people that know who she is because of her story and what she's doing every day to really help other people create whatever their story is. So, Elaine, let's bring on Elaine. So, Elaine Hartrick, thank you so much for being here. Um, and also thank you for your patience when we had this long chat and I got so excited about it. And I sent you an email and then it never went on my outbox. And like months later, I finally was like, oh, oh my God, what the hell happened? So thank you for being here. No, absolutely. I'm excited to be here. So as I said, I know when I posted just a little while ago that you were going to be here, there's people that I know that are out there like, oh my God, I know Elaine, but I want to watch this. And then there's going to be people after this is live, they're going to go like, I know her and I, they're going to want to hear your story. I don't know how many people store, really know your backstory completely because, and you'll reveal this in what you do now, there's a lot of people that know you in your position that helps lots of people. And some, and I don't know you well enough to know, are you one of those kind of people that's a big sharer? Um, maybe you are, I don't know, but um, we're gonna find all that out today. So I also want people to know, this is part one, because I, I asked you, please share your story because I know it will be inspiring and helpful to many people. And then we're going to come back at a separate time with a part two after you reveal what you do, um, <laughs> because I want to be able to have you share more about what it is you do, where you do it, and with the people that you are helping to transform. So with that being said, the very first question I'm going to ask you, and then you're just going to kind of go on from there, is I, I would just like you to think about, when I talk about the tale of, the tale of your scale, most of us that have been challenged with our weight or well-being have been on a roller coaster back and forth, back and forth. And one of the things I've learned over the years for myself and for many people that I work with, there are early stage issues, thoughts, beliefs, whatever stories that have happened the first time you either stepped on a scale, were told that you needed to step on a scale, join a group, whatever. Do you remember like what was that earliest time when you actually had a relationship or you started this path of like thinking about your weight with a scale, probably obviously bathroom scale at that time, maybe doctor scale. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a great question. I actually don't think I've ever been asked that. Um, and just and I will ask you one question. I am an oversharer, so I'll try to I'll try to keep myself I'll try to not no, overshare. Share. Okay, no, I'll just share. Let it rip. Um, let it rip. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I I probably started weighing myself when um, I was. Yeah, maybe 15 or 16 and uh, realized that, oh, hey, that's a thing. You know, you've got to sort of um, watch your weight and uh, and then sort of went into this mindset of, uh, well, am I is that the right weight for my height? Am, am I thin enough? You know, I think a lot of girls go through that. Unfortunately, I think a lot of go girls go through that much younger now uh, yeah. than when I was that age. But uh, but yeah, that was probably when. Um, yeah, and I probably had nothing to lose, maybe five pounds or eight pounds or mm -hmm. something, you know, at, at, at 16. I mean, I was, a, I was high school, played high school sports and a variety of things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but uh, I, yeah, I went on my first diet, you know, so that, uh, that, that was, that was the, that was the first mistake, but um, you know, it is what it is. That's what you do when you're, when you're that old. I talked to my mom about it and, and uh She's like, well, I heard this grapefruit diet and, and, uh, you know, I think that was my first one and then Scarsdale and then on all those things, but I really didn't probably have weight to lose. You know, I was just maybe not as fit as I could have been, but, um, but yeah, I really didn't start to struggle in a big way, uh, with my weight until, um, until I was well into adulthood and started going through some sort of traumatic experiences. I mean, I, I've got, got two children and I gained, I probably, I gained a significant amount of weight during my pregnancies and, but lost a, you know, good portion of it. And I mean, always sort of from that 16 year old self uh, on a diet to my, when I sort of went into a, another sphere of, of weight gain, you know, I'm sort of always on a diet or wanting to lose that 10 or 15 or 20 pounds, but 
nothing crazy until later. So. Yeah. It, I think a lot of people that, uh, and you're not the same age as I am, I'm much older than you, but I think a lot of us that were um, from a little bit a while ago, I think it was, it's, most people seem to be that kind of teenage time. And unfortunately, like what you said, I'm finding that a lot of that is much younger now, unfortunately. It's, mm -hmm. it's really unfortunate, you know? So, and I think that's another reason why it's helpful for any of us that have experienced that to kind of share what we had experienced so that maybe we can help and not only just individuals, but I also think um, parents. I think one of the things when I was with Dr. Heisinger recently out in LA, his big push, um, you know, the doctor from Biggest Loser was he said, we just need to get people, young moms, before they go too wild early on for all of us to kind of understand it. So, but th mm -hmm. thanks for sharing the, that. I was just curious. Sometimes people go like, oh my God, I was like five years old and, you know, you never know. So it's always helpful for people to kind of understand that what's most secret, most common is not that unusual. We all have had some mindset or something that kind of triggered that but so once you did that now i now we know you were athletic so okay there was a case you're athletic you're doing things or whatever so you kind of sounds like you had a pretty good foundation in terms of your sense of athleticism and ability and whatever so when you started to go from that what was it that kind of had you kind of maybe go off the rail from where you were it sounded like you're pretty healthy state at that time yeah i mean i was definitely not picture sort of mm -hmm. a picture of health i mean i was I was, it was, oh yeah, I should worry about this. But I mean, I wasn't, um, yeah, I played sports and things, but it wasn't anything crazy. I wasn't a, a like a college athlete or anything, but mm -hmm. yeah, but uh, some awareness um, of it anyhow. And then uh, got, uh, I got married quite young and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and had two children. And uh, unfortunately, uh, just went through some really challenging experiences in my uh, in my personal life, in my marriage. Uh, ended up being a victim of domestic violence, and really struggled to um, try and help this person and save this person. And uh, you know, I I had confidence, I had self esteem, I um, I didn't see myself as somebody that was sort of deserving or or, or um, worthy of that. Uh, uh, definitely took on the role of Okay, this is a very broken person with a, a, a sort of um, checkered past, and I mm -hmm. need to save this person. And so, stayed in that relationship far, far, far too long, and uh, became uh, really focused on him and raising my children and trying to make sure my children had uh, sort of no exposure to that, which I was able to do successfully. And so, uh, they were never really aware uh, what was going on, but really then um, tried to be strong for a very long time and just put myself at the bottom of the list and uh, then struggled with depression and mm. uh, food became my drug of, course, of choice. Uh, uh, I don't drink alcohol. I don't smoke. I don't do sort of anything like that. Uh, prescription drug, nothing. All of the wonderful things we can go to <laughs> gambling and all the, all the wonderful uh, sort of drugs of choice when we're trying to cope with pain, because that's really what it is, right? I mean, we're trying yeah. to cope with pain. And um, it's a maladaptive way of coping with pain is turning to something. And so, mm -hmm. so food was my food was my thing. And so, yeah, over a relatively short period of time, I sort of ate my way uh, through that uh, that pain and uh, gained uh, about 135 pounds in, a, in short order, about three years. So did you do that? Um secretly like i was a big secret eater did you do that secretly where people didn't really know what you were up to but you're like they're kind of going like she's putting on some weight here what's going on yeah for sure in fact i don't you know is anybody is anybody not secretive about that i think anybody that's in that kind uh, of state right yeah i think anybody yeah. that's in that sort of state when it comes to food and eating and and being out of control there's so much secretive uh it's so secretive because yeah. so much shame like there's so much shame with that. So for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm just like so many other people that have struggled with, uh, uh, using food as a, as a, a way to cope or as a drug. Um, yeah, you eat in your car, you eat late at night, you know, um, all you're eating yeah. all the time, right? You're eating all the time. So no. So you, in a short order, Okay, so it's it's one of those things that, you know, some people can't put weight on, uh, but mm -hmm. any of us that, for whatever reason, have this metabolic w ability to do it, um, it, like, you somehow stopped at 130, 
but once you, I mean, when you can put on a hundred pounds, you can do the two, you could do three. I mean, people can. So what, what was that inciting incident that you're like, okay, I'm, I'm like, was there something that stopped you from that? Yeah. Great. Great question. Uh, yeah. I mean, I wasn't stopping. I mean, I wasn't going, Oh, okay. You know, 135 pounds. That's my limit. You know, I mean, I wasn't stopping. I was, uh, I was just waking up every day. I'd finally got myself out of the marriage and, uh, uh, and you know, my life was sort of unrecognizable and my kids were having some issues. And I, uh, I woke up one day and nothing about how I saw myself or my, um, my values and um, how I, f I felt about my, um, I guess, I guess who I am was not in mm -hmm. alignment with how I looked, how I felt. It, there was, you know, I wasn't sort of living my authentic self to, you know, to use a word that we, we talk about a lot right now. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I just said enough, enough, I can't do this anymore. And so uh, I uh, came home from work and I mean, I had still wonderful support of family and I had a good job and I had a nice home, but I came home from work one day, looked around my home and thought, Hey, I'm paying for this mortgage. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to work. And is this what's important? Is mm. this what's important? Like, what am I doing? There's a giant gap here between how I'm living and mm. who I am and who I knew myself to be. And so I thought, what am I, what am I going to do in order to uh, close that gap? So I uh, listed my house and as soon as my house sold, I walked in and uh, resigned uh, my position at work and got uh, uh, in my car and drove to uh, Movara Fitness Resort, which is in southern Utah. I had Googled it. I was just looking for, um, looking for uh, places that were um, able to help me with where I was. I needed sort of healing, not only physically, but emotionally, mentally after I was in that marriage for 23 years. So it was a very long time, wow. a very, very, a very, very difficult experience and uh, really looking after everything and everyone but me. And uh, at the time, Movara uh, in Southern Utah was a Biggest Loser resort. And so mm -hmm. I, uh, I arrived here and I walked in and I thought, okay, I'm going to use the equity in my home to stay here as long as I need to stay in order to uh, get back in alignment with uh, who I am and close that gap. And so I arrived and I was here about three days and thought, this is, this is all I need. This is the mm. place I need to be in order to uh, do what I need to do. Cause initially I had thought, well, maybe I'll come to Southern Utah for a little while. Uh, there was uh, another resort in Malibu, California at the time. There were, there were a variety of competitors and I thought, well, right. maybe I'll just hop around. And I got here and thought, this is, this is all I need. This is exactly what I was looking for. So I thought, I'm just going to stay here as long as I need to stay in order to accomplish what I want to accomplish. And I didn't have a particular uh, period of time or a weight number necessarily. I just thought, I'm going to stay here until I feel like I've accomplished what I need to accomplish. And so I ended up staying nine months, which I'm actually the longest guest that's ever stayed in the history of, of the resort, of Movara. And, uh, and what that entailed was uh, every single day, six to eight hours of uh, working out. And that was a three hour hike in the Southern Utah Red Rocks every single day. And then the rest of the day we were, were spent um, doing cardio classes. And uh, I did it six days a week for uh, yeah, about nine months. So it was uh, you know 30 plus weeks. It was life changing. And when I left, I was in the best shape of my life. I mean, it's 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 not un, you know not dissimilar to what an Olympic athlete would do when you're spending six, seven, eight hours a day working out. You can imagine. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, even doing that for two or three weeks, you're going to see a huge improvement. Well, I did it every day for months and months and months. And so, yeah, I was in amazing shape, and uh, it sort of set my uh, changed the trajectory of my life, and sort of set me on a path that. Uh, allowed me to do some really interesting things as a result of that. And, and yeah, really just changed the course of my life. It was the best decision I could have made. And, and yeah, I spent all the money on uh, the equity in my house and, and was it worth it? A hundred percent. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, I do it every day again and twice on Sundays if I had the opportunity, if I needed to do it again. So. 
what what's fascinating about that story is that there i mean there's a lot of things you could unpack i mean there's a lot you could unpack because the 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 story of of what you were going through in terms of your relationship and i i work with a lot of women have a lot of conversations um and one of the challenges that i've seen and it sounds as if you've been able to do that and i'm sure you're able to help other women tap into it is i find that when women a lot of times they're very smart they're successful they're strong they are like these rocks of making things happen even in spite of what's going on and yet they have a hard time actually um owning their success or or feeling good about what they're doing and i, I can't tell you how many times i have these conversations like like well I, it's it usually ends up being i only it's an only like no or they dismiss it and so what's fascinating, and I know you're, you're kind of just giving the highlights of it, but that's that whole thing you did in general is gigantic anyway, going through relationship and separating and doing all that stuff. And then for you to actually sell the house and go and do that and then stick with it for nine. I, you said the longest person there, you may be in the 1% of people in resorts that are well-being resorts that have stayed at that level. The other part that's, to me interesting is and we'll get to the other part of what you're doing there but um as you know there are people that make a transformation and then they go back to a, the environment where they came from mm -hmm. without changing any of that so for yourself you made that transformation then you left did you have a a, a period of time where you struggled with going backwards into what you were doing before at all or, or was it not that case yeah, no, great question. Oh, for sure. I mean, again, you know, when you develop habits of, uh, of how to cope with emotion, because we saw bad days. I mean, even even though yeah. my life has improved significantly, yeah, bad days. And so do you cope through food? For sure. You know, you need to change. You need to change what uh, what caused you to choose food as an outlet. And mm -hmm. so uh, because life's still not perfect ever for any of us, uh, mm -hmm. even if it's 99%. So, uh, I, uh, I did go back to, um, like once I left here, I, uh, I, I was pretty good. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I probably stayed within 10 pounds, but mm -hmm. I mean, I was well aware of the statistics of, Hey, people that are morbidly obese, they gain all of their weight back plus more. And, you know, the less than 2% can keep it off. And I mean, I knew, and so mm -hmm. I'm not, gonna I'm not going to be that. I'm not going to be that statistic. Uh, but sure enough, life happens. And so I probably gained back. I probably gained back 40 pounds, uh, probably mm -hmm. two or three times, probably 30 pounds, two or three times, probably 20 pounds, two or three times. I'm, I'm probably up 15 right now. Um, but you know what, Jay, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm in still in the win column. Like I still consider that a win because yeah, uh, I did not gain all my weight back plus more, or even, you know, even 75% of my weight, I was able to still uh, learn. And every single time, one of the things that came from it is one of the, every single time I gained uh, some of my weight back, whether it was 20 or 30 or 40, uh, I learned more about myself and what yep. was causing that. And so the next time, so I would lose it. And then the next time I'm like, okay, I'm not going to do that again. Mm -hmm. Do I still struggle? Absolutely. I mean, I'm still working on it constantly, but you know, I've got 15 pounds I'd like to lose. So, uh, yeah, I lost a hundred pounds here and, yeah. uh, and, uh, uh, it's, you know, it, again, it was life changing, but, but yeah, it's not been easy. I actually graph my weight and it looks like a Richter scale. I mean, it's mm -hmm. up and down constantly. Right. So, and I can name experiences at the top of the peaks on every single part of my graph. So, yeah, it's 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 just life. So, somebody said to me one time, which I think is really a great way to look at it. I mean, and that's that's our weight, that's scale, that's our body composition, um, that's how life goes. But here's the great part: if you want to think about, it, for somebody's like, oh, you know, they think that there's going to be some perfection. I'm going to get somewhere. I'm going to stay there. But but whatever that is, which is not the way it works. No matter who you are, I don't. I have not met anybody that's like that. Because here's the other thing: if you're in the hospital, you want your heart to do this. If you're doing this and you're flatlined, you're done. So the idea for people to think that they're going to flatline, they're going to get to somewhere and they're going to do that. What do you guys have and where you're at? You guys are in the place where you 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 get better, not because you're flatlining and running around hiking, saying that you are going up, you're going down. You're that. So I think that's one of the. I'm glad you shared that 
because back to when we talked about secret eating, anybody that thinks that they are somehow protecting themselves and their image by not letting people understand, like, yeah, this is an issue. Sometimes have people have it seasonally. Sometimes they have it relationship-wise. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always looking for people, and I, I'm curious about this for you. Like, I love food. I'm a good cook. I love great things. I will eat anything. And yet I don't have the same appetite I did when I was like over 400 pounds. I don't know how I ate that much stuff. I don't have the same appetite, but I'm not going through the rest of my life going like, I'm never eating pizza. I'm never eating a cake or what. Like, so you, it sounds like um, you're kind of in the same spot where you're enjoying your life. It's going to be up and down there. And the other thing I do, I'm going to insert here too, because I did pick this up from Haizenga. He said, and it's not a new secret, a lot of the biggest loser contestants go home we all go home and you go back in the same environment and i know sometimes people po because they didn't have quote unquote support okay i get that whatever i mean such is life for everybody in their world wherever they live but what heizenga said when they did the studies he said the people that actually even if they gained their weight back even if they gained all their weight back the ones that actually kept exercising and kept moving even mm -hmm. with gaining the weight were the ones that significantly were healthier so i'm not an advocate for saying just eat like a maniac and gain all your weight back and just move around. It's better if you can find a balance. But I know this is what you guys are up to there. You're getting people to understand what's not really up for going uh, forward is not doing anything and sitting around. Uh, mm -hmm. Because even if you're not quote unquote overweight, that's just not gonna work well. So what's your what's your thoughts in terms of like you with food or exercise now? And we get that up and down, Up that's you're a human being, it's great and it's good you share that, but like, What's your life like? It. I mean, you. I'm guessing you love food, and you still probably love exercise. <laughs> uh, I don't. Wouldn't say I love exercise. Okay, <laughs> I, that's fine. Uh, yeah, I. Uh, but I do love food, uh, mm -hmm. so I. I need to love exercise. Um, but I don't actually. I don't need to love exercise. I do. No. I mean, I do like to eat, but I. Um, you know, I think we need to find a place where, you know, moving our body is what is, is critical. I mean, just moving right. our body and doing something that um, we enjoy that we're going to continue to do. And so, uh, you know, they, there's all, obviously tons and tons of conversation about, you know, what's the best workout? What's the best, you know, what's it's, it, it's oh, the yeah. one that you'll, it's the one that you'll do. Right. And of so, yep. um, I mean, I know myself, I'm not going to spend hours in the gym lifting weights. It's just not, it's not my thing, you know, but I yeah. like group exercise and I like hiking uh, and I, I like some racket sports. So I try and intersperse those things in my life that keeps my body moving. So yeah. it, as you know, well, um, it really, it's 80, 20 though. It's really 80% what's on your fork. Right. And so, Without a doubt. right. And that's one thing that's been a huge uh, uh, transition for me is, I used to tie, I used to sort of punish myself with exercise because of how I ate. Yeah. And I've only recently sort of transitioned out of that where I want to move my body because I like how I feel when my body is moving. I like how I feel when I'm fit. I like how I feel, how my clothes feel when I'm fit. It's good for my cardiovascular, what's going on inside. Uh, and not because I need to lose weight or not because I need to maintain my weight or not because of my weight. Right. right? And so I've just, just now disconnected the two and it's been a huge, uh, a huge um, eye opening experience for me. It's something that uh, Movara teaches as well. So. Yeah. I want to, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because when you talked about things that you learn and gaining weight and each time and whatever, I'm going to retract the word exercise because that is a very triggering word. And I'm glad you said that because I would agree with you. I, I we, I tend to use exercise as a term sometimes, just like an old analog default you do. But I would agree with you. It's going to be the thing that you're going to be willing to do. And it's going to be the thing that's movement. So I, I, I agree with you. There's a great book called Joy of Movement. I'm more in the conversation about the movement part. Um, yeah, there's actually, quote unquote, exercise things that I like. But, uh, you know, I've done CrossFit. I've done all the crazy boot campy things. What I got to tell you what, I don't love that stuff. I mean, I really don't. I, I, I do like cycling. I like Peloton. I like certain things like that. But I'm kind of like you. I, I do like, like, if I was where you are, 
like I would be outside morning, noon, and night because it's frigging gorgeous. I mean, so I love adventure and hiking and all that kind of stuff. So I, I, I'm going to retract that. And for all the people who are triggered by the word exercise, I would agree with you. It's not, you don't have to do that, but, but it, it is a problem. I mean, people freak out like, I can't exercise all the time. Well, you can get off your butt and walk somewhere. It's still better than nothing, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I'm, well, there's I'm, all the, you know, we can be politically correct about the, I mean, we, we can talk about it as nutrition and movement versus diet mm -hmm. and exercise. It's, it's, yeah. it is all what it is. It is, it's the same, but, but whatever words might be triggering for people, you know, so we talk about nutrition and movement here and, but it, it, yeah. it is diet and exercise. So, so since now, before we kind of, I'm going to move on a smidge. Okay. Mm. But before we do, um, I'm going to come back to the other thing that I want to talk about the working title of something you're doing, but we'll get to that at the end. But before we do that, on your personal story, is there anything else that you think would be helpful that you wanted to share at this point in time before we kind of move on to this other thing I want to talk about? Anything from what you've experienced or where you're at? Or uh, the other part that I would say is, how are your kids with who you are being now and what's going on? How, how has that been for them? Has it been helpful for them to see you be the mom that you become for yourself personally? What's that like for them? Yeah, that, that's also a great question. I'm actually glad you asked this because, you know, we were talking about, uh, you know, I was 16, I got on the scale for the first time and, and uh, you know, my mom's, you know, hey, how about this grapefruit diet or how about this, and, you know, those those kinds of things. And so, and she didn't know any better. Like, I mean, my, I have an amazing mother. Sure. Um, but uh, my daughter, I've got a daughter who's 22 and, uh, oh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, uh, and she's she's very slim and, and quite fit and mm -hmm. moves with her body, but, you uh, a couple of years ago, uh, she was working at a job that had her more sedentary and she's a college student as well. And that was the big thing was uh, being in college. And she had put on maybe seven or eight pounds. Just so her pants were a little bit tight. And she's like, oh, I'm going to go on a diet. And I just about lost my mind. So I'm like, oh, please, Paris, I beg of you. If you remember nothing from all of the years of being about just don't go on a diet. And mm -hmm. uh, well, why? Like you go on diets and people mm. go on diets, you know, and course talked about all the things that she sees on social media and and so uh, the advice I gave her which is the wish I had had I had this knowledge when I was her age uh, uh, I just asked her I said I want you to go get yourself a pair of jeans uh, a pair of jeans that has no lycra in it no stretch in it and I want mm. you to put those those jeans on and once a week I want you to make sure you wear those jeans. And if you find that your jeans are starting to feel a little bit tight, then move your body more that week. Watch your portion size for that week. Perhaps, you know, only have a dessert or something sweet on the weekend. And because you still need to live. And I want you to do that for several weeks until your jeans fit again. And then just use the jeans test. Just use the jeans test. And once a week, make sure you put that pair of jeans on. And that's the barometer. Don't stand on the scale. Don't, you know. And uh, that's what she did. And, oh, my gosh. Yeah. It's, and, you know, that's for these young girls. They, they, uh, they see so many images of all these things that they can do to have the perfect body, so to speak. And, and, and yet we all come in different shapes and sizes. And, and my daughter is slim. And, but her immediate reaction was to go on a diet. And so I hope, I hope, I hope that's that she remembers that for the rest of her life. So I just want to let you know that is a brilliant idea. And it's definitely going to be one that we're going to be having you share in a separate thing when we also get back to the documentary, which is another thing later on. Because when we talk about going beyond the scale, that technique is probably one of the most powerful techniques that I used to think was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever heard. Because being somebody that was 400 pounds plus, there was nothing worse than going to the big and tall men's shop. My, my wife would, we'd go there. I hated men that are, what did you call it? I was fat. I was overweight. I was obese, whatever you call it. Somebody calls it fluffy. Whatever it was to me, I did not feel comfortable. I hated going there. And the worst thing in the world was putting on clothes. When I lost weight on Biggest Loser and we went home and we got ready for the finale and I went in Banana Republic and I was in J. Crew and in all, all these places and I was like, I felt like I could go shop where others shopped and I could put on clothes and feel good about that. It was, I could understand and I had some people that said, I don't have a scale. I never got on the scale. And I said, well, how do you find out if you're gaining weight? Like you just said. 
I put on my clothes and if they're tight, I know, oh, I need to pay attention to that. I thought it was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard in my life. I thought that is ridiculous. You have to have a scale, like, because I was in that scale mentality. What mm -hmm. you said for your daughter is so powerful. And the closest thing that I can think of is I have a thing that's called my second skin. It's what I have from Finale, from Biggest Loser, when I was had lost 181 pounds, I wore this thing. I'm standing, there's a great picture of me standing in front of a sequoia tree. And I still wear this. And there are times when it's tight and the zipper's like, ah, but what happens is because there's no give to this thing. And, but it mm -hmm. mentally, it keeps, it has been so helpful to have this. So what you shared with your daughter, if nobody hears another thing today from what we've talked about, that is such a powerful thing because it's actually more of a sane way for a person to get related to, because if you're wearing stretchy things and all that other stuff and all, we totally lose it. So I, I'm so glad you shared that. that. That That's amazing. That's a great story. Love that. Well, yeah. And it's just, yeah. I mean, we, we get obsessed with the scale. I still am. I still work on that. I mean, I, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so, I mean, I can tell by my clothes, but you know, even cotton pants and things, they are stretchy, you know, like everything's stretchy. Yeah. I need, one pair of jeans that doesn't stretch and that's and that's what we need to do so yeah so good yeah well that's good I'm, I'm glad to hear that so if we're done with your story at the moment and like i said there's a lot more to your story and we'll get to that in a minute but um so you keep talking about here 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 what is your here and who are you that who are you at here yeah so i am at mobar right now and uh in the beautiful uh, town of, well, Ivins, Utah, which is a little suburb of St. George, Utah, beautiful part of the world. And uh, I arrived at Movar the first time as a guest in 2013 and then left in 2014. Uh, and I came back uh, twice a year for two weeks at a time just to stay sort of focused and sort of my health and wellness goals were still sort of paramount to try and not gain that weight back. And that was one of the things I was able to do was just kind of come back a couple times a year for two weeks at a time. And I did that and uh, developed uh, a relationship with the owners, Cameron and Michelle Kelsch, and uh, they are the founders of Movara. And uh, we just stayed connected. My background is in hospitality, hotel management, business consulting. Uh, I um, was an executive coach for uh, a number of years and life coach and, and, uh, but all sort of in the hospitality industry. And so we stayed connected. And uh, over the years, they said, you know, if we, you'd ever, uh, you know, like to work here, we'd love to have you come and run the show. And my kids were still in high school at the time and just wasn't, the timing wasn't right. And we just kept having the conversation and, uh, Three or four years ago, they asked me again, and again, the timing wasn't right. I'm also Canadian and uh, from Calgary, and so it was a big move to, to come here. And, and so, uh, yeah, so uh, it'll be, oh gosh, it's two years right now. Uh, they contacted me again and said, hey, we would love you to come and run the show and, and be our general manager, and, and uh, we know you understand this program. We know you understand uh, what needs to happen here in order for our guests to be successful. And then with your background in hotel management yeah. anyway it's it's you know the right fit so yeah so i sort of pulled up stakes and and uh, came here and uh yeah i've been here for two years and uh took some you know some paperwork and things as a canadian to get the governments mm. to be happy about that and so uh so got all that organized and yeah so i'm the general manager and uh it's an incredible opportunity to uh, see people's lives changed and uh, to see people saving their lives every single week and uh, have the experience that I had. Now, nobody's ever stayed as long as I have, but <laughs> people, come for, people come for a week or two and then they go home and they're able to work on, on their, um, their goals that they, uh, they want to achieve at home. And, and there's so much to learn here. And that's one of the reasons I think that provided a successful uh, path for me is uh, we have a strong education series here where guests learn about mm. how to change their lifestyle long term, and we have 11 lectures a week that they sit in on as part of the program, and that's critical. It's changing here because we can spend all day working out or or yeah. in the gym or in the pool. We can uh, eat perfectly, but we need to we need to change because we need to go home and we need to live life, and so we have to change. Um, we have to change what's the root of the problem. So, 
One of the things that um, when I was with Dr. Huizenga, he had mentioned he had a, a, a place that he had built um, and he was doing his own thing out there in, in California after Biggest Loser. And then it got destroyed in the Woolsey fire. So like a whole bunch of stuff. So he didn't rebuild that. But in and Gloria and I still have to edit the podcast from that time a few weeks ago. But he had mentioned very much what you guys are doing there. He said, look, we can do all kinds of stuff. But he said, you really got to get a team of people. You got to be able to be in a place in an environment. You need people to have some chance to kind of understand how to live life in a way that they can really enjoy and become, you know, much more in a well-being environment. It's not a reality show. I mean, what I know you guys are doing there is much more on a very powerful way for people to transform themselves. So I think that what's great is the work that you're doing is changing lives and, and hopefully through your examples and what you're doing, there'll be more of you guys continue to be able to expand that as well, as well as other, I mean, you can't do it everywhere, but mm -hmm. other places. And I think that a lot of the people that I've been talking to, I've become so intrigued that even though COVID has caused a lot of issues, I think finally for the first time, everyone is getting to realize that the entire way that we're living our life um, can work or not work. And it's not just eating or moving or exercise, whatever. It's really like what you were describing, you know, what's the life that you're living? What's the environment, you know, emotional, mental, like all this stuff that we didn't really ever talk about. Like, it's okay to talk about it. It's okay to talk about it and find out there's more people that are doing it. So it sounds like what you guys are doing with your programs, you're, you're touching all those points, checking off all those boxes, besides just people beating themselves up and eating less and all that stuff that in the old days was how we thought we'd change it. But it, it's not the, uh, the, the prescription, you know. So um, with that being said, part mm -hmm. one is you sharing your story. Um, part two is I want to come back to you at the resort with some people that you have that are some people you think are great, like yourself in a different way. Everybody has a different story where we can ask them some questions and they can you know, be able to share some things. Maybe we can actually have the camera move around a little bit. Some people can see some things. Um, so that'll be part two. We'll do that in a few weeks. But I wanna be able to close on, I'm very intrigued. I'm so excited you're doing what you're doing because I love your story. I think it's uh, more people that hear about it and learn about it. You're gonna you know, have more and more people that are gonna be inspired and, and they're gonna find their own particular pathway. So you are halfway through a book um, I'm so intrigued with your working title. So working title typically means, and I know what that means, like it's a placeholder, but it's a cool working title. So what can, what can you share, Elaine, about um, what you're doing with, with this book that you're working on? Yeah, well, as a result of my time at, uh, at Movara, uh, you know, when you're in optimal health, so not mm -hmm. just physical health, optimal emotional health, mental health, which is what happened. When you spend every day working on yourself, uh, it, it, it heals a lot of things. And uh, I was just in the space where I felt like I could accomplish anything and do mm. anything. And uh, I uh, took up uh, running uh, while I was here and it was sort of an inadvertent, um, uh, reason. So there was a guest here at the time, uh, a gentleman from Texas, David, and uh, I had been here maybe three or four months at, at that time. And, uh, he came to me and he said, Hey, why don't I'm getting a group of guests together. Let's go run the snow Canyon half marathon. And I said, Hey dude, <laughs> I, I've never run in my life and, uh, I've only, I'm only hiking. I'm, I'm hiking every day uh, with the resort. And I said, but I've never run. I said, maybe, you know, when is it? Let me know. Hmm. And, uh, you know, give me some time to train. And this was a Sunday and he said, it's, it's Saturday, next Saturday. Oh. So Dave, yeah. There's no way, like, there's no way I can do that. And, uh, he's like, come on, you can do it. You, you can just walk the whole thing. Come on, you can do it. And so I thought, Oh, I don't, I don't, you know, no, just, you know, no. So he was very persistent Tuesday. He comes to me and said, okay, deadline for registration is today. And I, I said, David, he said, just come walk it. I'm like, fine. So fine. I said, okay. So we, we go to the start line Saturday. I thought, I'm just going to walk it. We get to the start line. Of course, what happens that, you know, the, mm. the gun goes off and everybody starts running and I have no business even being with these people. I was still probably, 
oh yeah, at least 50 pounds overweight and mm-hmm. no business being this group of people. But I started jogging because that's what you do. And I didn't like it and it was hurting. And I thought, okay, I am going to jog until I don't feel like I can anymore. And then I'll start walking. Well, don't, you know what? I jogged to the jog to the entire thing. I didn't stop the, the entire wow. way. And so, I, so I ran all 13.1 miles of this race and uh even beat david actually and gave oh. him a hard time with it so which was funny wow. and uh, i wasn't fast but uh but he was he was a big guy too and he was working on his on his health so uh so after that i thought okay that was the hardest thing i've done my entire life i'm never going to do that ever again and then like a month later there was a 10k in the area and i thought oh, okay well maybe i've done a half marathon i can do a 10k so then i did a 10k and then um and then I thought, okay, I'm not going to do that again. And then a month later, there was a 5K in the area. And so then I did a 5K. So then um, after that experience, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm in this great shape. Maybe I'll train for a marathon, but I really don't want to. But it's the only distance I haven't done. And, uh, uh, I, you know, what am I going to do? So I thought, well, maybe I'll find a marathon in an interesting part of the world. That will motivate me to train because I really didn't want to do the training for it. So I went online and looked at all these marathons all over the world and came across something called the Seven Continents Club. And it's an organization out of Boston. And in order mm. to uh, in order to be included in this sort of exclusive club, there wasn't very many people that had had uh, participated in at the time. You had to have run either a half marathon or a full marathon on all seven continents. Wow. And I uh, and I thought, oh, that's amazing. A million people have run marathons. This is way more interesting. And I uh, still had some money for my house and. And, uh, and also meant I didn't have to run a marathon. I could run a half on every continent because you couldn't mix the distances. You had to either run oh. full in order to, to be part of this, this group. So, so uh, I, um, that was actually one of the catalysts for, okay, I think my time at Movara is done. And, and I had reached my 100-pound goal. So uh, three weeks later, I got on a plane and uh, flew to Beijing, China, and ran the fifth hardest half marathon in the world, which was on the great wall, right on the wall, you run on the wall and uh, ran that uh, marathon. And then subsequently over the next 10 months, I ran a marathon on all seven continents, including Antarctica. And uh, so it put me in a pretty exclusive group at the time. I think I was less than 160 women who had ever done it in history. And uh, yeah, so I was able to do that and, and uh, yeah, I got on the news and women's running magazine did an article and I just suddenly was like, what is happening? And, and it was just so, so amazing to, to experience as a result of the work that I had put in. And, uh, and that was, that's what happens when you put in that kind of um, effort in looking after you. And, uh, and then during that time, I also, uh, climbed Kilimanjaro, uh, which ended up being during the worst snowstorm they'd had in 18 years and summited and uh, went over to Spain and backpacked the Camino de Santiago. Oh, wow. Yeah, uh, by myself and uh, did that in the middle of all of that. And so I was doing about 30 kilometers a day on the Camino. And and so when you're feeling healthy and strong, you uh, you just, it, it just changes everything. And uh, I even even ran for a uh, beauty contest, a beauty pageant in my local city, and I didn't win, but I'm pretty sure it was fixed. So. <laughs> no, no. So I mean, I was just in this mode of I'm going to do anything. I can try anything, and uh, and that's what happens when you're feeling strong and healthy. And and uh, yeah. So kind of back to my book. Um, it's a it's an interesting story. There's a lot more to it. This is sort of about one percent of it, and sort of what led uh, what led me to. Um, the experiences that led me to sort of pull up stakes and, and sell my house and quit my job to come to Movara in the first place and the experiences that I had uh, uh, running those races and climbing Kilimanjaro. And uh, it's actually, uh, it, it's, I'm extremely pleased with the story. It's, um, it's, it's coming along really well of a ghostwriter that's helping me. And, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful story about uh, it's about a mother's love. My children are involved in it and, and some of the things that they went through. And it's uh, about um, really going after your dreams and, uh, and, and not, and it's about not being stuck. It's about closing that gap. It's about who you are and who you know yourself to be and your values and living that sort of um, authentic self and being in alignment with who you are and 
and not living that way and, and reaching that and, um, and about resiliency and, and, and making that move, getting unstuck. So, um, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited about it. Well, first of all, I will be, when we're done, I will be ordering, pre-ordering the book because my, I have a lot of womanly instincts. I'm very male, but I have womanly instincts. And I don't know why, but I had that idea. I'm like, I don't think I can really introduce you. I'd rather have it be revealed. Well, you just like, you and I had a lot of conversations. We did not have this conversation. I had Maybe no, not. I thought, I no, this. no, that this mm. is not a conversation that you would have that even I'd have a senior brain a little bit, but even I would have remember, I know you mentioned Mount Kilimanjaro, I had that, but this other whole thing about the continents and everything else you're doing, like I, we didn't have that conversation. So I'm glad I didn't introduce you because it wouldn't have done any good. And I'm now what happens is I'm gonna tell people, okay, so you need to hear Elaine's story. And as they tell you, you got to wait to the end because she's going to reveal something that like, that's kick ass. That's amazing. That's an, that's an incredible story. And what I love about it is that is so going beyond the scale because I, I not to say I've, I've done a lot of things that I'm proud of now that I had gone through a wellness transformation. I've not run seven continents and all that stuff, but what I will tell you, you had a different experience than I've had, but it's the one part that is the same. If people could only understand the reason why Biggest Loser actually, if you look at the show, forget what you like and you think it's whatever, what it shows, and you do this all the time with people, what it shows is that people against all odds that you would look and say, there's no way in hell this person could do whatever. Actually, when they're given a chance or given support and they, and they have an environment that gives them a chance to transform themselves, it's crazy what people can do. Your story of what you did, where you were, and all those things that happened in the depression and the challenges, the mom stuff and all that, and then you did what you did, and then you're general manager there, and you're helping people, and then you're doing everything else. Like, that's why you want to get well. It's what, what I call create the life that you love and live it well. You are literally like the poster woman for that. Your story is it's amazing. And you know I'm not blowing smoke because I didn't have this conversation. I'm, I'm the reason I'm excited. Like, that's a that's an amazing story. And I hope people get that because that's, there's no fun in losing weight. It's really not fun. And then we also agreed exercise. It's not really fun unless it's fun exercise, but what you're doing and how you're living and then sharing that with others. Like, I'm so glad you're doing what you're doing. And I cannot wait to read the book and learn more about it because that's like, I had no, little late. I did not know. Mount Kilimanjaro is a big deal. That's cool. That's great. I want to do that too. But everything else, like that's amazing. Very cool. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, it's um, it's going to be a good story. I'm I'm really proud of it. Actually, it's uh, yeah, I'm proud of the writing and and um, yeah, I'm excited. It's 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 going to be a good story. So I uh, there was yeah, we've just yeah barely the surface of what's in it so it'll be good yeah no, that's fine and and in, in another conversation i i know some people that would love to learn more about what you're up to so yeah keep writing it do your ghost writing do everything you got to do get it out there i'm going to pre-order the book i can't wait to learn more uh selfishly i think i'm gonna to have to sneak out to southern utah and um <laughs> you and i need to be up in the mountains and i need to be able to interview you somewhere in a great location because selfishly i'd love to do that i think it'd be a lot you of gotta fun come. you gotta come it's yeah amazing. I, I, I will be out there. I don't know when yet, but you got me now. I definitely got to come out there and do that. Um, okay, so thank you for this. As I said in the open this up, this is part one. This, I'm so glad you shared this. And I know it's still the tip of the iceberg of what you're up to. So we'll learn more in the book as well. Um, you and I figured out with our schedules. I'm really looking forward to being able to have you expand upon what you're doing um, by sharing some of the stories of other people that are that are with you at the resort. I think it's going to be a lot of fun for people to do it. Um, and um, Gloria, do we have, a, we want to make sure we put their, their website on you. I mean, it's not like they don't know it. We'll put it in show notes as well but for people that want to um, go out and see you guys. And so with COVID and everything, I mean, are you guys like super booked now or you have a lot of openings or just in general, like what, what's trending now with you with, uh, with after COVID? Yeah, great question. Yeah, we are slammed, uh, oh, which is good. amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Now we are 21 weeks in a roll, row now, sold out completely. So wow. yeah, so we're just uh, 20 weeks historically and, and sort of a four. We've got some rooms available at the end of July and through August. Uh, so um, it is, uh, it's, 
so uh, wonderful that people are taking their health seriously in terms of a positive byproduct of COVID um, that yeah. people are, you know, the comorbidities that uh, affected people so negatively, one of them being obesity. Uh, it has really, uh, really, you know, woken a lot of people up to, Hey, I need to look after my health because uh, it's, it's critical. And something like this doesn't need to be as big of a worry for me if I'm in optimal health. And so, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's really wonderful to see. And I mean, we were busy anyway, but uh, yeah. you know, it's just, it's, and people are wanting to get out and, and uh, get moving again and travel again. And, and it's a beautiful part of the world. And it's, it's an amazing program for uh, the community that's here, the other guests that they get to meet here and, uh, and spend time with and, and lifelong friendships are made and, um, and just this beautiful part of the world and the hiking and the red rocks and the beautiful weather and the blue sky and uh, our program where we hold people accountable and um, everything's done for, for our guests. I mean, all of our healthy, nutrient-dense meals are provided for them, accommodation. You just come and you just get to work on you. So, um, yeah, it's an incredible, it's an incredible place. And like I said, it's, it's wonderful to see people that come in on a Sunday, it's one week program. So they come in on a Sunday and leave on a Sunday. If you, it's minimum a week, but people stay for multiple weeks like I did. Um, yeah. Uh, but to see them come in on a Sunday and, you know, have their head down and feeling badly about themselves and, and not in alignment again with sort of who they are and other aspects of their lives. And then to see them leave with their heads held high again, feeling confident again and, and, uh, and uh, themselves again. Yeah. I, I work in the best place in the world. So. That's great. That's great. Mm -hmm. Well, Elaine, thank you so much for your generosity of time and sharing this. And as you know, there's somebody out there that's going to hear this and they're going to thank you and they're going to say something. And then there's a bunch of people that you'll probably never hear from and you've changed their life and you might hear from them later on. And I think that's a great thing about when you get a chance to share something that you've been doing and it becomes a catalyst for somebody else. So, um, Keep doing what you're doing, um, and I'm looking forward to, in a few weeks, we'll get back together, and we'll continue the story. And as um, I mentioned to you guys before, and Gloria, if you put up one more time, yeah, look, um, pre-order the book. I mean, that's a really cool thing. Uh, I think it's a really great story. Share it with other people. It might be a catalyst. That's the other thing I found a lot of times. If you read something that's amazing and you think it's really wonderful, like buy an extra book and give it to somebody else because sometimes that's the thing. It, I don't know what it is, but like, if, if there's ever a thing you could do, if you can give somebody some sense of hope that they can do something for themselves and stories like yours are a great example of like, it gets all odds, it, it can be done, but you got to show up. You got to take that first step and um, your story is definitely that kind of a story. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Here. And one thing, TJ, if uh, anybody wants to come to Movara as a result of, of watching the podcast today or, or, or okay. listening to it, um, uh, use the code Elaine, and then I'll throw them in a $50 uh, card to our spa, and they can get a massage while they're here or something like that. So if you want to throw that up as well, Gloria, and then wonderful, and then we'll do something for them for, for having watched. So We'll do that. And we'll put it in the show notes as well. And we also will we'll have this come out at different times as well. So we'll make sure people know about it. So thank awesome. you again, Elaine. And we'll see you in a few weeks. Okay. Thanks Perfect. everybody for being here.